I never played the original Resident Evil games, mainly because I didn't grow up with a Sony PlayStation and because I really hate tank controls. I mean, I can't stand them. I can put up with them in something like Croc or Tomb Raider, but if we're talking about the claustrophobic areas of Resident Evil with those fixed camera angles, I'll give it a pass. That being said, in the mid-2010s, I did end up playing Resident Evil 7, a game that immediately blew me away. I think it's fair to say that it actually was my favorite game on the Xbox One. So imagine my delight when I discovered that the original Resident Evil games were remade in the same gameplay style of Resident Evil 7. Well, except for the first one. The first one got a remake on the Nintendo GameCube, but that was still tank control. There was no way I wasn't going to play this game. I thought about saving it for another month of horror marathon later this year, but uh, I can't help it. I gotta play this right now. Be warned that in this video I'm gonna be talking about my entire experience with the game. That means it's gonna be spoilers from start to finish. So without further ado, let's take a look at Resident Evil 2. First off, there are two characters to choose from, Leon Kennedy and Claire Redfield. I decided to play as Leon because his name is at the top of the list. Leon's story begins with a guy on a radio show talking about how he saw a woman who looked like a rotting corpse just the other night. The trucker listening almost immediately rams into a woman who turns out to be a zombie, probably the same one. Cut to Leon at a gas station. He hears a crashing noise inside and decides to go investigate. Something's not right. Leon is a police officer on his way to transfer to the station of Raccoon City. He's clearly not the sharpest tool in the shed. You all right? Don't move. I'll be back for you. Or the brightest bulb of the bunch, but he's a good guy. We see our first zombie chow down a cop and hightail it out of there. On the way out, we meet Claire Redfield, who was also on her way to Raccoon City, to find her brother, who hasn't been in contact with her for six weeks. Luckily, she's a gun-toting girl, and we make our way back to the car. Unfortunately, Raccoon City isn't doing too much better than the gas station we just escaped from. Leon and Claire get separated from each other. Leon successfully makes it all the way to the police station he was originally going to. Leon checks out camera footage to see that zombies have overrun the place, but there's at least one surviving officer. Her. Judging by the way he handles zombies, I'd say he's got about the same IQ as Leon. Who claims to have found a way out, so we gotta find him. It's not hard, we just have to sneak under the electric door that says keep out. One hallway later and we find our man, just as half his body is devoured by a zombie. Leon picks up a notebook the officer dropped and makes his way back to the front of the station where we meet Officer Marvin Brenach, injured in the line of survival. I'm sure that won't end badly. Brenach informs us that there's possibly a secret way out of the station that can get us to safety. There's a statue with three empty spaces. We have to find three medallions to to fill it up, each one already attached to its own statue requiring you to put in the correct code or sequence no, to get. To figure out what that is, you have to find pieces of paper shredded from the notebook Officer Elliot dropped. And so this is where we really figure out what Resident Evil 2 is all about. A slow-paced survival horror game where you have to exercise caution and item conservation to survive. You see, you have a gun in this game, in fact there are a few different guns you can get, but ammo is scarce, so you really have to be careful when and where you use them. Zombies are the main enemies of the game. The problem with them is that you can shoot them down, but that doesn't permanently take them down. After a while they get back up, as much a problem as ever. There's really two options. You can either shoot their legs enough to where they become crawlers and easier to navigate around, or you can keep shooting their head until you get lucky and get their heads to explode, letting you know they're down for good. Your health is represented by an ECG signal. Green means you're a lean gun machine, yellow is mellow, and red is close to dead. Unlike other games where saving restores your health or naturally restoring health over time, you have to either use a first aid spray or a green herb to heal. This means it's absolutely possible to use up the finite amount of health items too early in the game and making the remaining portion of the game extremely dangerous to get through. If you're not careful enough, you could essentially softlock yourself from completion. The cool part about the limited resources though is that you can combine them in different ways. In addition to green, there's also red and blue herbs. Blue herbs cure poison and red herbs strengthen whatever herb you combine them with. You can even combine all three herbs together to essentially become superhuman for a short period of time. There's also gunpowder you can find which, when combined, creates ammo. So the temptation is to hold on to everything you can while playing, but that's not how Resident Evil works. You have a very small number of slots to hold items, and some items even take up more than one slot. That's why you have to utilize the item box. There's not a lot of them to go around, but they're all connected to each other. So if you place an item in one, you can retrieve it at any of the others. The scariest limited resource of all is saving your game. Well, it's not actually limited to how many times you can save, but you can only save at a typewriter, which is usually placed right next to the item box of the area. Now do you get it? Resident Evil 2 ain't playing around. This ain't your granddad zombie game. Uh, well, I guess maybe it kind of is. Uh, the original came out in 98, January 98, actually. So, um, 
But the remaking granddads, uh, yeah, you get it, you get it. Armed with a knife, a gun, and very little ammo, I start to explore the station. Oh yeah, I forgot to mention, there are secondary weapons in this game too, like knives, which you hold with the left trigger to arm. These are more important than you think because enemies will often try to cling on you and do a great deal of damage if they succeed, but if you have a secondary weapon, you can shove it into the enemy and get away. Also, you've got a map in your menu. Rooms that still have items in them appear red, and completed rooms appear blue. Reminds me of Luigi's Mansion. As I go along, I come across some boards I used to blockade windows, a safe I don't have the code to, a couple of lockers I don't have the codes to, and a security area with missing keys on the terminal to release the doors to the items they contain. This is part of the intrigue and suspense of the game. There's helpful items and weapons just at your fingertips, but you're gonna have to find the codes later on to get them. This means that possibly, just when you thought you were done with an area, if you really want to arm yourself to the teeth, you're gonna have to go back to a place you may not want to go to. Part of why this is suspenseful is that sometimes zombies break in through windows, so there might be more enemies the next time you come back than before. I do a once around the station and Marvin radios for me to come back to show me something. When I get there... Jeez! That one legitimately got me. When I get there, Ganach shows security footage of Claire. She's made it to the station. Yes. I use the spade key to go through the door. Another thing I forgot to mention. There are keys you need to get for locked doors, all represented by card symbols. There's a diamond key, a heart key, a spade key. You get the idea. Outside, Leon and Claire find themselves separated from each other by a locked fence. Also, a helicopter crashes into the side of the station, alerting all the zombies to the area. Claire can't get through the fence, so we gotta go our separate ways. Luckily, there's a cutting tool here. I make my way back to Mars who's still alive, but barely. I continue my scavenger hunt through the station, finding the three medals. As I do, a new enemy breaks in. Lickers. Lickers are nasty brutes. The only way to beat them is to blow their brains out, but they can take a real beating. They don't have eyes, but a keen sense of hearing. The best way to deal with them, in my opinion, is to just go around them. So long as you walk, they don't hear you. They only chase you if you run. It's tempting to try to kill them so they won't be a problem later, but as long as you walk every time you encounter them, they aren't too much trouble. After placing all three medals in their slots, a secret entry way appears. The escape from the station. Leon tries to convince Marvin to go with him, but Marvin is like, bro, have you seen these injuries? I'm not gonna make it. The secret exit leads down into what I believe is some kind of sewer system, where some kind of mutated, still half-human thing gets the jump on Leon. Oh, won't work on this thing. oh, Leon, you, you, you lovable idiot, you. At first, this fight is pretty intimidating. The only vulnerable spots are the eyeballs. However, as it turns out, you can kind of cheese this boss 90s style by walking circles around him and stabbing him. And actually, fun little fact I found out later, for some reason, your frame rate determines how strong your knife is. So, if you're playing on console on a regular TV, that may not be a big deal. If you're playing on a PC at a super high frame rate, you could hypothetically take this guy out in a few seconds. It's a... Uh, Look it up on YouTube, it's a beautiful thing. Once Leon gets his final shot in, the big bad mutant abandoned ship and a ladder mysteriously drops. Somebody's watching you. Leon makes his way up from the sewer, only to be attacked by a zombie dog. But he's saved just in the nick of time by Ada Wong of the FBI. Surprised you made it this far. Are you telling me that you've been watching me this whole time and you never even helped me? That's a little messed up. FBI, huh? What's going on here? That's what I'd like to know. Sorry, that information's classified. Lady. We're experiencing what I can only assume to be the apocalypse right now. And for that matter, we're in a survival situation here. I think government regulations are out the window by this point. Where are you going? Do yourself a favor. Stop asking questions and get the hell out of here. Well, maybe if you help me get out of here, I could do just that. God damn. I don't like Ada Wong very much. I mean, how is she walking around all clean and sassy in the middle of a zombie outbreak, wearing sunglasses at night, indoors? Screw you. Ada disappears through a doorway. We hightail it after her, making our way to a jail cell where we find a man asking if Chief Iron sent us. I think that must be the chief of police of the station Leon was transferring to. He says Iron locked him up there, the reason being that he was gonna blow the whistle on his operation. Leon, of course, is skeptical. The man says if we help him get out of the cell, he'll let us use his key card to get outside of the locked parking garage. Leon refuses, saying certainly Iron must have had a good reason. <sighs> You know, if I make a comment every time Leon does a stupid, we're gonna be here all day, so... Suddenly, a hand blasts through the wall of the cell, crushing the prisoner's head. In comes traipsing Ada Wong. But how, though? How did I reach the jail cell before her when she was ahead of me and there was only one way to go? It would have been impossible for me to reach the jail cell first without passing her by. Ada informs us the man was her informant and then refuses to talk anymore. Find a way out, Leon, before it's too late. Then we'll talk. 
then why don't we look for a way together? It doesn't make sense for us to be separating in this dangerous situation. Jeez Louise. So if we want to get out, we're going to have to get the parking pass out of the jail cell. To do that, we're going to have to get the power back on. And if we want to do that, we'll have to find the proper electrical parts. It's scavenger hunt time. Hopefully we don't run into whatever it was that killed the guy in the jail cell, which Leon and Ada seem to be underwhelmingly unimpressed by. Doing a little digging around, I got the power turned on in one section of the parking garage by the dog kennel. Upside, lights come on. Downside, zombie dogs get released and chase me. Upside, they're pretty bad at attacking me as long as I keep running. I run for life until one hallway brings me back to the police station. As a matter of fact, it just so happens to be the area we saw the officer who found the notebook for the secret entryway get chowed down in half. Which now that I think about it doesn't make a whole lot of sense to me. The whole point of the secret entryway was to escape from the police station safely, but the police station leads to the parking garage, and the parking garage is where the officer we saw earlier running back from through the hallway that we're traveling through now. What that means is that the police always had access to the location that the secret entryway leads you to with only one zombie in the way. If Officer Elliot hadn't spent so much time lollygagging in front of cameras and having long pauses in front of the zombie, he would have gotten out of this just fine. Huh, wonder if he's related to Leon. Back at the police station, I start to clean up shop, opening safes, lockers, finding keys, and opening new areas. Coming back a second time, the station is significantly more dangerous than before. Not only are there more zombies, but also liquors. And Officer Banach has finally turned into a zombie himself. I feel like this really drives a line between the first half and the second half of the game, because the front of the station used to be a safe space. It had a typewriter to save and zombies would never follow you in. Once Branach turns, however, our safety net is gone. Zombies can and will follow you, even opening closed doors to get to you. We're in the big leagues now, kids. After some pillaging and plundering, we make our way outside on the roof or balcony. There's a water puzzle to solve, and once we do, the fire of the helicopter goes out. Leon on heads into the hallway and... Jesus Christ! That's a Terminator! That's a Terminator! You can't tell me that's not the zombie version of Arnold Schwarzenegger. Ladies and gentlemen, allow me to introduce X. Mr. X to you, he does not sleep. He does not rest. He does not stop. He can't be killed. He can't be reasoned with. He can't be bargained with. It can't be reasoned with. It doesn't feel pity or remorse or fear. And it absolutely will not stop. The thing that crushed a man's skull in its hands with ease is now after us. I both love and hate the dynamic of Mr. X. The same way I both love and hate getting scared by a good horror movie. Safe is a four letter word now, a figment of your imagination. The only thing you can do against Mr. X is run away. But running is a double edged sword. You see, if you run, Mr. X will hear you and pinpoint your location. Once you get away from him, if you want to stay away, you have to walk. Another difficulty that arises with Mr. X is when he's chasing you down a hall that has liquors. Before, you could just walk through undetected, but when Mr. X catches sight of you, he marches brusquely towards you. So if you walk, he'll get you. And if you run, the liquors will get you. Damned if you walk, damned if you run. And of course, if you ever shoot your gun, Mr. X will hear that too. There is one area that Mr. X will refuse to follow you into though, the dark room. It's hilarious. Hilarious watching him come at you, turn around and leave, come back, turn around and leave. Reminds me of the fights I used to have at the apartment with the police in Grand Theft Auto 4. Okay, so I spend some time scouring the station. I find a large gear. I use the large gear to restore use of a clock tower. I ring the bell. Well, let me tell you, I'm about to have a heart attack when that thing started up. I mean, I got the heck out of Dodge with that one. A box drops from the bell containing the last electric part to get the power going in the jail cell area of the parking garage. I maneuver my way back to the jail and take longer than I like to admit solving the electricity puzzle and grab the parking pass from the dead detective. Leon also finds a recorder on his person. As he plays it, we hear the detective interviewing some woman. He asks her about an orphanage for which Umbrella Corporation is a benefactor, a G virus, and a sinkhole in the middle of the city that he says leads straight to her lab. We also find a memo calling Mr. X the tyrant probably ordered to kill all witnesses of the zombie outbreak. Okay, so I might have known more by this point if I had played the original game already, but oh well. I've definitely already heard of the Umbrella Corporation, and I'm guessing that the G-Virus is what turns people into zombies. A pretty common trope by this point in time, but this game originally came out in 98, so it might be one of the earlier representations of zombies being created by chemical warfare. I'm not sure. What I'm the most unsure about is the mention of the orphanage. What would a corporation that creates bioweapons, or at the very least sells the virus that creates bioweapons to other people, want with a giant orphanage full of kids? With the power back on, it's out of the frying pan and into the oven. 
All the jail cells open up, releasing the zombies inside. A couple failed attempts later, I get to the parking garage with Mr. X picking me up one-handed, getting ready to crush me like a grape in a nutcracker when Ada Wong rams a SWAT vehicle into him. This is getting old. Saving your ass, that's twice. Can't even let me be grateful for 10 seconds without making me hate you again. Can this lady take a long walk off a short pier? Mr. X starts to shift the SWAT vehicle, but Ada self-destructs it, stopping him in his tracks. Maybe this time he's actually dead. Leon follows Ada to the large sinkhole mentioned in the tape recorder. With the road out of commission, they decide to break through a gun shop to get around, encountering the owner and his daughter, clearly infected with the G-Virus. Ada threatens to shoot the daughter, but Leon convinces her to stand down. The man takes his daughter back inside, and we hear a gunshot go off, left to assume the father shot his own daughter. You know, I would say that up until this point, the game has mostly been lacking in the emotion department. It's been mostly campy with a little bit of tension, but this scene right here, I'm not even afraid to admit, it got me. A father whose wife is already dead, watching his little daughter, not dying a quick death, but a slow transformation into a monster. A little girl who doesn't understand what's happening even as it's happening to her. And the only way for the father to save her is by ending her, thus leaving him alone in a cruel, human absent environment. That's a truly powerful moment. As we walk away from the scene, Ada finally spills the beans. Heard of the Umbrella Corporation? They're a pharmaceutical company secretly making bioweapons. They have a virus. It turns people into indestructible monsters. That's why I'm looking for Annette Birkin. She's the one at Umbrella responsible for unleashing the virus. I'm going to bring her down. I'm guessing Annette is who we heard being interviewed on the tape recording. Ada says that to get to Annette, we need to go through the sewer. Come on. Sewers are run by the city. How could they have a facility without the authorities knowing? Welcome to corporate America. I mean, is she right or is she right, boys? As we walk through the sewer, Leon gets separated from Ada because when he hops down from a catwalk, he ends up being confronted by a freaking huge crocodile. We then enter a chase sequence that I swear game companies the 90s love putting in their games. You know, the ones where you have to run toward the camera, unable to see what's ahead of you. The crocodile gets its mouth caught on a large flammable pipe, which Leon shoots. Unfortunately, Ada was able to keep up with us. I was really hoping we'd get separated again for the rest of the game. Fairly quickly, we run into Annette. The encounter goes a little something like this. Annette, we meet again. Hand over the G-Virus. Nah, do it. Do it now. Hey guys, check it out. I can light zombies some fire. Bye. Ada drops her glasses and Leon gets caught in the line of fire, which, unfortunately, you probably realize what this means. We have to play as Ada now. <sighs> I'll do it, but I'm not gonna like it. All right, let's get this over with. Ada has something called an EMF visualizer. It allows you to track wiring and hack electronic equipment. It sounds cool, but mostly you just end up blowing out fans so they don't slice you up. Not exactly thrilling stuff. Well, well until freaking Mr. X shows up again. Man, I thought this guy was done for good, but he, he really is the terminator of zombies. Ada escapes by blowing out another fan and slipping through the cracks. Putting on her investigation cap, Ada wanders into an incinerator, Annette immediately popping out of nowhere and trapping her inside. The incinerator turns on but Ada blows the thing out with her EMF visualizer. Catching up to her, she claims Annette probably killed her husband to take credit for the G-Virus. Annette activates a big metal thing, shoving Ada off the platform, impaling her leg. We then cut back to Leon. Oh, thank God. This section of the game, we come across what is potentially the most annoying enemy in my opinion. These big guys hang out in the cramped quarters of the waterways. It's about impossible to get around them, and killing them uses up an ungodly amount of ammo. You have to destroy a protective layer, and then destroy their giant eyeball. So long as I didn't have to backtrack too much, I personally found it easier to just run into them and when they grab me, stick them with a secondary weapon and bolt. You gotta be careful though. If they catch you and you don't have a secondary weapon on hand, they'll poison you, which slowly lowers your health over time and slows you down. You also randomly cough and move even slower when you do, which can lead to death when trying to maneuver around zombies. Leon finds where Ada is but can't get to her without opening up a locked door. In the strangest security system you ever did see, you have to plug in the correct chest piece plugs into the slot they go. There's a note on a table nearby giving a hint of how they're supposed to be placed. So, it's scavenger hunt and logic puzzle time, a Resident Evil 2 tradition. Before completing this, I find a VHS tape. 
It shows that thing Leon fought before killing a couple of guys. This feels like foreshadowing if ever I saw it. So I do the go around in the sewers. I actually end up finding a tool that allows me to access another secret way back into the police station. When I get there, I develop the rolls of film I found, one of which showing a hiding place. I've already been to the spot before, but apparently it doesn't become interactable until I see that it developed film with my own eyes. Inside is ammunition for the flamethrower. Being the hoarder I am, I store it like with everything else that isn't handgun ammo. Which, by the way, you might be wondering why I haven't talked about all the different weapons up to this point. Why haven't I broken down how each one works and what's useful against which enemy? And the reason for that is because I haven't really used them very much yet. I know it sounds crazy, but I wasn't joking when I said that I'm a hoarder when it comes to video games. So far, I've only used the pistol sparingly and then carried secondary weapons for when I get grabbed by enemies. I used the shotgun on the first boss, but that's about it. I have a really bad habit of not using the majority of items that I get through a game, hoarding it, and then all of it going into the waste at the end. It kind of makes me feel like crap sometimes, but I will say there is a rush that comes from being overprepared when you fight a final boss. One sewer section later, I plug in all the chest pieces and run into the guy from the videotape. Now I've seriously enjoyed the game up to this point, but this next boss, it's really grating. I mean, I might just suck, but well, Check it out for yourself. So you end up on this platform where you have to use a crane to ram storage or whatever it is into the boss. But you have to make sure you don't get hit too because that's instant death. You have to do this three times. If you fail at any point, you start over. This sounds simple, but I had a really hard time with the timing. I found the boss either always stalling outside of the path of impact or me just barely not making it out of the path myself. To be honest, this part took me a long time. Maybe for other people this was easy, I don't know. It probably would have helped if I had actually used my weapons on him. I kept trying to time it where he charges at me, I dodge, and then he gets hit. Eventually I do beat him, knocking him down to the abyss below. Leon reaches Ada, pulls the rod out of her leg, they flirt, Ada limps, they get in a cable car, they kiss, Ada says go on without me, Leon does, thank god. Exiting the cable car, we finally reached Nest, the lab where the G-Virus originated. It's quite the different atmosphere from the rest of the game. We've gone from the dark wooden museum vibes of the station to the grotesque vibes of the sewer to the bright and shiny futuristic vibes of the lab. The name of the game here is Finding the G-Virus. To do that, we have to get access to the whole facility. Starting out, we've only got a level 1 key card, but we gotta get up to level 3. The place is crawling with zombies and liquors and one new enemy type, Plant 43, the Wandering Ivies, another bioweapon devised by Umbrella Corporation. Luckily, I haven't used any of my flamethrower up at this point. I'm normally really bad about excessive conservation, but if you give me a weapon that is really good against a specific enemy, that's when I feel the freedom to go ham. I gotta say, I really like the designs of these things. I don't know what sound it is they're making. It all sounds like a lower pitched version of when someone is gasping for air, but also trying to speak at the same time so that they try to speak with the inhale rather than the exhale. I burn the place down and find the herbicide synthesis. It's a formula you have to put together and cool down immediately to destroy the infected plant life. To do so, you have to get the solution in the machine at exactly the right height in a single vial for some reason. This looks like it would be the easiest puzzle in the game, but it actually ended up being the hardest one for me. I got really frustrated with this one. I mean, I I think I actually did spend 20 minutes messing around with the vials until I finally got it right. After getting the solution, I find my way to the part of the lab where I can cool it off, head back, and insert it into the emergency protection machine to end the plant infection. As I do, down drops a level 3 key card. Also, Mr. X comes busting in through a window like the Terminator through the car cop window. Bro, how? How? How did this guy survive? How is he here? What is he made of? I start booking it out of there, taking the time to watch another VHS tape I find. It shows soldiers ordering Dr. Birkin, clearly the husband of Annette, to hand over the G-Virus. He resists, and they shoot him. So, looks like his wife didn't kill him after all. I find the G-Virus. Huh. That was easy. Oh, I wish you wouldn't have said that. Self-destruct sequence will begin when lockdown is complete. Of course. I run back to Ada as fast as possible, but get stopped by the big mutant guy. Annette busts in the room saying he's hers. This has to end. She shoots him with what I assume is like the solution we used to kill the plants, and finally she breaks the whole situation down for us. Somehow, William survived getting mowed down by machine guns and infected himself with the virus. Turns out the big guy is William. In hindsight, I probably should have figured that out way 
earlier. It's actually kind of obvious. Annette blabbers on about how they never intended for any of this to happen, which, I mean, I feel like she really doesn't have a leg to stand on here. If you willingly directly contribute to the creation of a virus, there's really just no scenario involving that where you're not a bad person from the word go, you know? Even if you don't start a zombie outbreak, you know what chemical warfare is for. It's for warfare. William gets up and tosses Annette like a salad, and we enter the final boss. Oh yeah, baby. This is what I've been saving up for. Time to break out the cavalry. That's right. Burn, baby, burn. <laughs> And it begs Leon to destroy the G-Virus. He says, uh uh is evidence. And she's like, you know Ada Wong is an FBI, right? She's a mercenary selling to the highest bidder. Leon calls bullshit. I hope you're right, but if the G-Virus gets into the wrong hands. Bitch, you created the virus to sell in the first place. Don't get all high and mighty now like, oh, you were creating a weapon of mass destruction for a good cause. No, you literally did it for the same reason. You created it to sell it. God. I didn't think I was going to find another character that I hate more than Ada Wong in this game, but here we are. Leon makes it back to Ada and asks her if she's really FBI like a big old dingus. Unsurprisingly, she pulls a gun on him. So that's all this was. I was just some pawn to you? Brr. I thought you liked me for my personality. How could you betray this relationship we formed over the course of two hours? The betrayal is real, guys. I'll never forget all the good times we had with Ada. Like that time she walked away from me, or that other time she walked away from me. And then there was also that time she walked away from me. Leon pulls a shoot me if you're gonna, but I know you can't move. And freaking Annette pops up and shoots Ada, who drops the G-Virus, and then the bridge drops them! No one gets that sample now. I have contained my rage for as long as possible, but I shall unleash my fury upon you! Leon holds on to Ada for dear life. Forget it. Oh, okay. <laughs> so, Annette dies, Ada dies, it's a real tragedy, boo-hoo. Leon runs through a security room and sees Claire on a monitor. Oh yeah. I forgot she existed. Somehow, Claire is down here too. Who knows how or why. They both tell each other they need to get out and the connection breaks up. Leon starts booking it again, but Mr. X appears. It's a fluke though. He promptly gets caught in an explosion. Dead this time? Not dead this time? I don't know. I just start making a run for it again. Leon activates an Akira elevator and Mr. X says, Psych! A boss battle activates, meaning it's time to finally deal with this guy hands on. Some guys wear their heart on their sleeve. Mr. X lets it stick out of the center of his chest. I shoot that a few times with mag bullets, and then some mysterious figure tosses Leon a rocket launcher. Launch a rocket, and Mr. X truly, finally goes down for real this time. Leon catches the train to find that Claire and some girl are already on it. The end. And that's the end of Leon's campaign. As a whole, I thought it was really great. The slow pacing, the atmosphere, the cheesy 90s goodness. If that had been the whole game, I would recommend it to everybody, but we both know that's not the whole game. There's still a whole nother side of this story we gotta play through. If you've already beaten the game with one character, when you select story, the other character will appear as a B-side story. This isn't just for the sake of experiencing the other character side of things. You have to do this to get the true ending as well. And you better believe I was ready for it. Now having beaten the game, I had unlocked some extras. Actually, some I unlocked and some came with the version of the game I purchased. I'm not sure which is which. Either way, it's no surprise that Claire's story shares some similarities with Leon's. So I decided I wanted to make the second run more about the fun than immersing myself in the atmosphere. There's an option to toggle the music and sound effects over to the 98 original, and there are low poly 98 versions of the characters you can play as. Claire's story begins exactly the same, with her side of the story really starting up when she makes it to the police station outside of the fence when the helicopter crashes. I felt like everything Leon did up to that point should have taken a lot longer than how long it took her to get to the station from when they separated from each other, but uh... Eh, it's a video game. No need to look too deep into it. I love watching Low Poly Leon and Claire meet up with each other, in contrast to the incredibly realistic graphics they're surrounded by. Their mouths don't even move when they talk. Hello, Claire. How are you doing today? You're looking a little low poly today. Why, I'm doing just fine there, Mr. Leon. A low poly a day keeps the high poly zombies away. Oh yeah, that's true. I forgot. Claire and Leon go their separate ways, and Claire's story truly 
play begins. Although the order you find items and coast to the lockers and safes are different now, Claire's playthrough in the station goes pretty much the same as Leon's in the beginning. Except that Mr. X appears the first time that Claire goes into the station. But that makes sense when you consider the timeline. The second time Leon got back to the station, Claire was probably still there for her first time. It's not really until you go through the secret entryway that Claire's story really starts to take on its own identity. At this point, I decided to switch Claire's costume back to her regular one. I had really enjoyed messing around in low poly form up to this point, but the music really had me wanting to take the game more seriously. You see, the remake sound design was mostly quiet and minimal, making every single creak and step stand out. It was very effective and a big part of what I loved about my Leon playthrough. The classic 98 game had music playing through almost the entire experience, and I thought that I was going to appreciate the remake much better. Now, I'm not saying that I like the original sound design better, I don't, but there are definitely times when the music is used very effectively to create tension and atmosphere. You know, it's funny. I've never played the original before, and yet for some reason when I play the classic music, I get a deeply nostalgic feeling. The like of which I get when I play Pokemon Gen 1 or Super Mario 64. Perhaps it evokes memories of a style of design programmers used when I was a child. I wish it were possible to play the classic music, but still use the remake sound effects. Once through the secret entryway, Claire discovers the little girl we saw at the end of Leon's story. The visit is cut short as William attacks. One boss fight later and the little girl asks Claire if she can help her find her mom. Of course she agrees. As they walk, the little girl Sherry says her mom works for Umbrella Corps, making an important new medicine. That must be Annette's daughter. Oof. That poor girl. Claire and Sherry make it to the parking garage and out comes some freaking jackass. As a matter of fact, it turns out to be Chief of Police Brian Irons. He holds us at gunpoint and tells Sherry to tie our hands. He smacks Claire hard enough to draw blood and then takes Sherry away. Claire breaks her hands free, but not fast enough to get out of the parking garage before the door closes and locks. God damn, they finally give me a companion in this game I like and they rip her away. You freaking bastards. All the doors are unlocked this time around in the parking garage. Well, the powered ones, I mean including one leading to an elevator down to the police chief's office. I scavenger hunt my way through the garage, find the diamond key, and use the elevator. Inside the chief's office, we find copies of emails to Chief Irons from William, thanking him for his support and security efforts. He asked him to kill any of his own officers that he has to, including those who have survived that mansion. Now this raises a lot of questions for me. Like I said, I've never played the first game, but from the sounds of it, I'm guessing that the characters in the original game worked for Chief Irons, which if that's the case, does that mean that all of them died off camera in this game when the zombies broke into the station? Did this game pull an Alien 3? Dang, man. It was also about at this point that I realized that probably the point of the orphanage was to test the G-Virus on kids. It's gonna be easier to deal with a kid G-Virus gone wrong than a full-grown adult G-Virus gone wrong. Inside the Chief's personal collection room is a key card for the parking garage locked away. Gotta do the same type of puzzle Leon had to to do as Claire. Before moving on though, can I just say that this is freaking beautiful? I know I've mentioned the graphics before, but sometimes graphics don't shine in ugly environments, but outside of the taxidermy being something that creeps me out, I feel like the police chief's office and collection room show off the incredible graphics of this game, more so than any other area. Anyway, I go back to the station, do our little song and dance with Mr. X, get the pieces I need, and get the key card. But just then, the phone rings. It's the kidnapper, Chief Irons. The scene cuts out whatever it is they say to each other. All we know when it cuts back in is that he wants Claire to come to him for some reason. When he was escaping from the parking garage, he had dropped something and Claire picked it up. I guess he wants it back. The game cuts to the perspective of Sherry. I'll admit I didn't see this coming. I thought she was only ever going to be a companion to protect. Sherry's deal is she needs to break out of the orphanage. I rummage around and- Oh my Jesus Christ! Who would make a doll like that? What child would want a doll like that? Ugh, god damn. Anyway, I sneak around. <laughs> The front door of the building is locked, do some more sneaking, come across a corpse, a little more sneaking, and bingo, found a key. Unfortunately, Chief Irons also finds us. Sherry splashes acid in his face, slowing him down, giving us the chance to sneak around to go back for the key, unlock the front door, front door is chained, sneak around, get caught by the corpse, and then William pops up, killing Chief Irons. Whew. Man, I know I just skimmed through all of that, but that was actually one of the most stressful parts of the game for me. It's funny how trying to get away from a human was a lot more suspenseful to me than trying to deal with zombies. But I think there's just something about a kid being in danger that gets to me in a way that nothing else does. It's kind of like watching get a cat or dog shot in a movie. You see a human get shot and it's like, 
cool. But you watch a pet get shot and it just feels like the end of the world. The game cuts back to 30 minutes earlier, showing that what Claire had picked up in the parking garage was a pendant and Chief Iron wants it back. Claire runs for the orphanage. Mr. X follows right behind her. Claire makes it to the orphanage where it turns out William hadn't killed Chief Irons. He had just pulled an alien on him, which I guess does end up killing him. Claire finds Sherry. Mr. X finds us. We make a run for it, ending up in the non-sewage part of the sewers. We dip into the elevator, but Mr. X starts to pull apart the doors. Just in the nick of time, William pops up, tearing a huge gap in Mr. X. He then proceeds to jump on top of the elevator, causing us to fall. Claire passes out with Sherry running away and comes to with Sherry's mom Annette snapping her fingers. Claire asks her where Sherry went and Annette basically ignores us, saying Sherry's fine. I feel like I get what they were going for here. The whole time Annette is very lackadaisical, practically forgetting she has a daughter and mumbling about how quickly the mutation has occurred and how she needs to study this phenomenon more. It's supposed to get across how Annette is essentially more married to her work than she ever was to her husband and was an absent mother to her daughter. But, I mean, come on. Even someone like that is going to show concern for their daughter running alone loose with a giant mutant on their tail. I already didn't like her before, but this really pushed her dislikability meter over the edge for me. Annette refuses to search for her own daughter, so Claire decides to take on the role. This part's pretty similar to Leon's. Travel through the sewers, get the chess pieces, backtrack to the hiding spot in the police station, this time getting the grenade launcher for fire and acid rounds, fight William, die a million times doing so, find Sherry who's been infected. Now with how long this video already is, I've skimmed over some of the lore that you discover through finding pages in the game. But by this point, we've learned more about how the G-Virus works. When the G-Virus infects somebody, it reduces them down to their most basic instincts, their pursuit of survival and reproduction. That's what was happening when William was inserting the G-Virus embryo into Chief Irons. Now the thing is, for an infected individual to successfully create another mutated specimen, they have to infect somebody with near identical DNA, like a twin or an immediate family member. That's why Chief Irons got aliened, but Sherry here is slowly mutating successfully. I'm also guessing that's why the majority of people turn into zombies, as opposed to giant monsters like William or Terminators like Mr. X. The G-Virus has probably mutated to be able to infect a wider variety of DNA, but at the cost of not having the originally intended results. I haven't actually seen this spelled out in the game, I haven't seen anything write that. This is just my personal hypothesis at this point. Annette sees them on the security camera. Claire tries to convince her she needs to help her daughter, but Annette says she doesn't have time because she needs to stop William. She tells her that Sherry could be helped at the lab, but literally ain't nobody got time for that shit. With Annette noping the fuck out, Claire carries Sherry all the way to the lab where she learns about the antivirus to cure the G-Virus. The lab is the same experience as before. Screw that freaking puzzle. Claire finds the antivirus and, as it turns out, Sherry's pendant is the key to get to it. This is the reason why the kidnapper wanted Sherry in the first place and, coincidentally, it's also how Leon was able to get the G-Virus sample so easily. That was easy. William appears for the last time again. Annette takes the antivirus back to Sherry while Claire kicks William's ass. Claire makes it back to Sherry herself and Sherry is fully cured. While this is going on, Leon activates the self-destruct, and with Annette being injured, Claire and Sherry have to face leaving Annette behind. Claire convinces Sherry to say goodbye to her mom. Leon's story got one big emotional scene. I guess Claire's had to get one too. While Leon ends up fighting Mr. X one last time, Claire ends up fighting William one last time. Honestly, uh, the fight isn't that hard. After William dies, Claire and Sherry take the train out of there. Leon hopping aboard. Psych! William isn't dead. Eh, but that's okay. There's a machine gun you find right before this part, so yeah, just use that and it's all good. The unlikely trio get outside and suddenly I feel like I'm watching the end of the first Terminator movie. You guys see that too, right? It feels like the end of the first Terminator movie. The end. For real this time. Or to be continued, I guess. Wee! I am not used to playing games that long. This has turned into quite the video for me. I mean, I'm pretty sure this is the longest one I've made so far. But that's okay, because Resident Evil 2 was a blast to play. Admittedly, I did end up liking Claire's story a lot more than Leon's, but I enjoy playing both as a whole. I think Resident Evil is going in a really cool direction here. If you like horror video games, then I would certainly recommend Resident Evil 2 to you. And if you like this video, I implore you, please, Check out the other videos on my channel. In my personal unbiased opinion, I think they're pretty cool. And if you end up liking the vibe of the channel, please give a subscribe because newsflash, there's more to come and I would love it if you were all here to see it. Until then, see you later. Bye.